Hey guys, welcome back. This is officially part two of Guest Blade, episode number 19, the All Tom Mayo Special. If you guys have not already seen part one, stop right now. You're going to miss a lot of details. Go back and watch part one, where we got into a lot more of the maker and his philosophies before getting into the knives. Once again, thank you very much to Chris, to John, and to Gene for sending and donating these uh, beautiful specimens of Tom Mayo's work. Now let's get into the knives. We'll start here with the big bad boy. We're going to get these out of the way so that my camera can more easily focus. All right. This is a big bad bitch. I don't care how you look at it. This is a monster knife. I have, I've only owned a couple of uh, pocket folders that were this big, and I'll give you a size comparison here with some uh, of the knives that I own. Uh, the closest one I'm going to have size-wise uh, is, of course, my... Joel Perella design, Brian Ty Bengal. You see they're almost identical. They're both four and a quarter inch blades. But since only 10 of these were made, it's highly unlikely you've seen one in real life. So let's give you some everyday comparisons. Spyderco, Paramilitary 2. Uh, as things should always be in life, butt to butt. Somebody asks, why would you put them pivot to pivot? Because then you got a little bit over on the blade and a little bit over in the butt and you can't make any sense of it. Now you can understand precisely how much larger it is than a paramilitary too. Another knife I'm not going to call it common, but one that people refer to often and we've all seen at some point. Uh, Todd Begg Bodega. Yeah, it's that much bigger than a freaking Bodega. So, yeah, this is certainly not a tiny knife. And then, last but not least, a 4-inch Curtis F3, my one-off that he made for me in carbon fiber. So there you go. Uh, it's still definitely a good size bigger than the F3. All right, size comparisons out of the way. Let's talk about the knife in general. Number one, super smooth, as you would expect, in its feel. And that would worry me if it were just a plain tie knife. It has such a slickness to it that this thing would fly right the hell out of your hands, except those holes that really are there for aesthetic purposes, because they look cool, and they complete that cool transformation, are really an aid in gripping the knife. There's just a little bit of added tactility to this knife by having those holes there. Again, I'm fairly certain that the origins of Mayo's holes had to be to reduce weight in a knife, and then, of course, the aesthetics of it. But in a knife like this, you know, maybe not so much with this little guy with only having one hole, but there's certainly a wonderful uh, grip that's been added to it. Not tremendous, but there's enough there that you feel it. Uh, the finger choil is adequate, helps you keep it locked in your hand nicely. It's got a little hot spot right there, a little bit of an edge that... Uh, I personally would have rather have seen dehorned a little bit. Then the butt flares out a little bit, so it's going to be great in pretty much any handhold, any position. It's a little big for my hands, which I love because I don't usually get to say that very often. Uh, a lot of knives tend to be a little bit small in my hands. Uh, this pocket clip is not original. It would have a standard spring clip. Oops, wrong knife. Standard spring clip like we have here on the Dr. Death. So do keep that in mind. This is an elaboration added after the fact. And one of the things that you'll notice is inside and out on every component is fully completely finished. Nothing is left unfinished. There is the lock face again. Again, these are all, you know, heavily used, heavily carried knives. Still looks nice and clean, beautifully uh, executed in every way. Very thick, by the way. Very thick blade stop right there. And you see where it comes into contact with the back side of the blade. Very thick. I would never expect that to give um, in any way, shape, or form. Going back to the lock bar tension, once again, it's perfect. Not too much tension. It's not applying. You almost don't feel any friction on this blade. It, it almost glides freely. Not quite as smooth as, as a lot of other knives that I personally own or have handled, but still very, very, very smooth. And probably smoother than 90% of all the custom knives out there that you're going to handle. Uh, perfect lock geometry, great interface there. Not too much tension like I mentioned, but just enough. That you, you know, you don't need 
any overextension uh, built in here. You don't need any lock bar stabilizer. It just it ain't going anywhere. Uh, kind of a standard looking pivot. Again, he's not big into making things ornate. He's making things that work, that happen to be beautiful. And again, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I happen to like the look of the knives. I like the ergonomics of this particular handle. It really fits uh, my anatomy well, even though it's a bigger handle, a bigger, uh, bigger frame. You've got a bit of this uh, palm swell going on here, the way that the frame is contoured. Everything is rounded off nicely all around the spine, the back edge. There are no major hot spots anywhere except for the one that I encountered right there holding the knife. And then every now and then when you go to disengage the lock, I mean, you can kind of feel the edge. It's not a sharp edge. It's still rounded. But being a slimmer piece of titanium, it can't be uh, too rounded. So there's, you're going to feel a bit of the edge. Uh, having carried this today, I could tell you for such a big knife, it actually carries very well. It's not really lightweight. It's still lighter weight than my Bodega. But you've probably still got a good six ounces here, I'd have to say, if I had to guess. And that, a lot of that is going to be in the blade. It's a very thick, but nice hollow ground blade. CPM 154. Nice satin finish. Again, this one has been around town a bit, so uh, keep that in mind. This is not an example of a brand new off-the-bench mayo. And from what I understand, Chris carries the hell out of this thing, and it's only showing minor wear on the titanium. So the finish work that's been done here is really, really nice. I love seeing into the holes at an angle. I love seeing the light uh, bouncing off those inner edges there. There is a certain beauty to this that it's going to make me sad when I have to send these knives back. It really is. These are really, really just, just super cool. All right, so that is the Moran Bowie or Bowie XL, however you'd like to prefer it, or I'd like to uh, pronounce it, I should say. Look at the other side, then we'll put her away for a bit. The action is smooth. It's not... I'm not a big fan of thumb slots. Um, a spidey hole tends to work a little bit better for me if I have to have a notch or anything. That's one of the reasons I despise thumb uh, discs. I'd rather have a thumb stud or a flipper, but uh, even for such a big knife with such a long reach, this one flips out nicely. You see, I'm not using any wrist action, not doing anything crazy. If you do, it really goes flying out. No lock stick, nothing uh, out of the ordinary there. All right, going into our next knife, we're going to go into the Dr. Death. Probably one of the coolest freaking names for a knife ever. I mean, seriously, Dr. Death. Just holy shit, man. So what we're getting into here is, again, another CPM 154. Again, uh, as I mentioned before, he marked them 154V. Uh, as he was focusing on uh, the vanadium content that was in the steel, making it highly corrosive resistant. And you're going to notice that as a theme with the, th the steels that he chooses for his knives. Every steel that he uses is very high in corrosion resistance. And I would have to assume that's because he lives in Hawaii. And that's something that's probably always on his mind around all that saltwater air, or salt that's in the air, I should say from being surrounded by salt water, just like me here in Miami. I mean, we have, you know, high humidity. We have a lot of salt in the air. It's just something that you, uh, you do consider when you buy things made of metal here. So I'm going to have to assume that this is extraordinarily lightweight. And it's so funny how we try to sometimes <sighs> relate quality to how much something weighs, where you'd almost want to say, oh, well, this feels cheap because it's so lightweight and it feels plasticky. Listen, it's carbon fiber. It's meant to feel that way. It's meant to be lightweight. It's a nice balance, I think, though. Um, a lot of knives in this size are going to be fairly weighty. And this is like three and three quarter inch blade right here. And uh, it's, a, it's a very thin blade as you take a look at that blade stock. You know, and it, it gets, it narrows down a lot toward that tip. This is not a hard use knife. I would say that the Moran 
you could probably hack through a, a friggin' forest with that thing. This is much more of a precision cutting tool, in my opinion. Also going to be good for all around daily tasks. You've got a nice belly to the blade. It's going to be great for slicing and dicing. It's going to be great for a self-defense weapon because that point comes down to a nice spiky tip. It's not too thin. Again, it's you're not going to use a knife like this as a pry bar anyway. You're not going to go prying open a paint can with it or anything. You don't use $1,000 knives to do that with. But uh, this is certainly going to be up to almost any daily task I can think of. And it's slim and it's comfortable and I would have to imagine that it's very, very easy to carry being so lightweight. You know, that day that you're going to throw on that pair of shorts instead of a pair of jeans, this beast at about seven, seven and a half ounces is not going to be the knife that you're going to choose for that. Something like this, it's slim, it's fairly small, it's crazy lightweight. It's going to be a, a much better EDC choice in my opinion. Love the feel of this. It's just, it's a classic, straightforward feel. There's nothing fancy about the ergonomics. This was not overly designed. You've got a natural built-in thumb ramp here. It's not uh, aggressive in any way. I don't think it's particularly overly effective, but it also flares out here. So again, determined by this blade shape, this is going to be a piercer or a stabber. And you've got just a little bit helping you from, you know, your hand sliding up and going up the blade when you encounter something tough. Uh, again, going back to the lock bar tension, it's perfect. You don't feel any drag on the blade from the detent ball. You don't feel that there's really any way that you're going to overextend that and run into any issues. It's just a simple, clean, nice knife. Uh, if it were mine, I would, I would definitely be swapping out the clip. I would want something a little... Listen, this is a, <laughs> not a cheap knife. Just not a fan of spring clips. You guys know me about that. I don't care who makes it, how much you spend... Uh, no, just, there's just, that's, to me, that's something that shouldn't happen on something that's built this nicely. And remember, when we're talking about the action on these, these are not knives with bearings, by the way. These are all done with bushings, and they are silky smooth. The blade is way too lightweight to try to get it to drop under its own weight. So, don't, uh, don't take that, me, me not doing that as a sign of it not being smooth. It is very smooth, great detent. Not super fantastic, uh, but certainly better than 90% of all the other knives you're going to pick up. This is one out of the uh, three. This might be the most practical and best all around of these three knives for everyday carry. Purely for any situation you could come up with, this knife is going to do that job. Almost guaranteed. And there are no real limitations. Oh, it's too heavy to carry today. Oh, it's this. I could carry this if I was wearing swim trunks. Again, I'm not going to go in a friggin' pool or the ocean carrying a knife. I'm not an asshole. But uh, just that lightweight material, you're not wearing a belt or anything like that. This is the kind of knife. It's a no-excuses knife. No excuse not to carry it. If you have a knife like this in your collection, there's no excuse to ever leave the house without a knife. Period. All right, so now we're going to move on to what is what might just be my favorite. And... <sighs> It's, it's atypical for what I, took, what I really like. I prefer flippers, not a big fan of slots, and just the geometry, how you have to hold this knife, it's not easy for me, with my hand, to flick that out. This is really going to be a slow opener. It's kind of like holding a Chris Reeve, uh, even though, of course, I do, flip my, do flick my Chris Reeves. Oh, you're not supposed to. Don't care. There's something about the fluidity in which this opens and closes. It's almost addictive. It's almost mesmerizing. Of the three examples that I have here, this is the silky smoothest one as far as the pivot action. I, this is also the most simple. There's a single hole here and nothing on this side. Again, this was an aftermarket embellishment. It is the simplest in design. It's the simplest in execution. And I also like the deeply chamfered hole. 
the ones I prefer the most that I've seen of, of Tom's work is when he mirror polishes that inner bowl against an all stonewashed titanium slab. It is so sexy. Now, this one is not polished, but it's still got a particular beauty to it when the light radiates off of it. And realize I'm talking about the beauty of a hole, and I'm not being dirty about it. I'm talking about simply a hole. A hole that seems to capture my imagination. It sounds ridiculous, but it's true. So this is a true covert. So you've got the flathead screws built into it, and you have the 6K Stellite blade. What is 6K? Oh, this stuff, it's like freaking gold, man. This is, and you can see this one has been used, yet it's still super sharp. 6K is a completely anti-magnetic, anti-corrosive steel. You can do whatever you want to to it. You're not going to rust it in any conditions. It's completely non-magnetic. And it's a non-galling steel that resists wear against other metals. Now, while that is a obviously a, a sure sign of quality if you're into building machinery, think about its practical application in a knife. Steel, rubbing on, it could be the phosphor bronze washers, it could be nylon bushings, it could be resting, honestly, just against this titanium. And you're not going to have any seizure. And by the way, titanium and steel do not like to work together. Obviously, there are bushings in there, so we don't have to worry about that. And the other cool thing is it requires little to no lubrication. Now, I'm not saying this knife specifically. I mean the steel, going back to just the steel, the 6K steel. It requires little to no lubrication. A lot of times, uh, 6K is used uh, deep inside, uh, parts that are deep inside of machines, where it's really difficult to do routine maintenance and lubrication. So I'm not gonna say it's a self-lubricating metal, but it is certainly one that requires very little maintenance. This is a knife that instead of lubricating it uh, every two weeks, uh, once a month, every other month, however often you, you typically lubricate your heavily EDC knives, you may have to lubricate this a fifth of that amount or a tenth of that amount and you're not going to feel any difference in the action. That's amazing to me. Now the problem, well again, one more plus is it has insane edge retention. It can take an absolute razor fine edge the way that it can be ground and it will hold that edge. It is one of the longest edge retentions of any steel that you can get. The problem is it's a killer of belts and drill bits. Makers do not like to work with 6K because their tools get wrecked. You go grinding this and it's just, it's you're gonna go through belt after belt after belt grinding this damn steel. You go making your pivot holes and, and your other cutouts and whatnot, you're destroying any drill bit that goes near it. So uh, it can only be worked with solid carbide tools, which as many of you know, Carbide tools are extraordinarily expensive. So you're, you're going to have to tool up. If you think you're going to be working with 6K, you're going to have to tool up specifically for it. The other thing is the, uh, the steel will not polish past a satin finish. And again, the satin finish would be like what he did here on this Dr. Death. So you're, you're not left a lot of you could do. You could do stone washing. You could do bead blasting. You can do satin finishes. Uh, maybe a rougher brush finish. He went with a really, really nice bead blasted finish on this, which I think, which I think gives it a nice working appearance. It looks more like a toned down work knife that's not meant to be anything special. Yet it is. I love this uh, MOA bead on here as well. I think that's super cool. Kind of, you know, being a gun guy as well, I think that's kind of uh, that's kind of cool. So very interesting. Simple standoffs. You got two standoffs at the rear, lanyard hole. There is your blade stop back there. Simple pivot once again. And another knife that does not need a lock bar insert, 
does not need a stabilizer. It's just made right. There's no wiggle. You disengage the lock. You don't feel any wiggle side to side on the blade. You know what? I didn't do that on the previous two. Let's take a good look at those. Nope, none there. Oh, the big bastard. None there as well. So what we've looked at here over the past 40 minutes, many people would describe to be as perfection. Are they worth the money they're going for? I'm not going to, you know, I plan on getting into that. And it's a longer discussion. So let's do this. Let's have a little bit of fun. We're going to make the first ever three part guest blade. Stay tuned for part number three, and we're going to have a discussion about value in these knives and others and see how they stack up. We'll be right back.